Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of America Society, we would like to thank and welcome you tonight to this conversation between Marina Reyes Franco and Ilaria Conti on the visitor economy regime. We are pleased to collaborate on this program with Independent Curators International, who has worked with Marina Reyes Franco since 2014, when she participated in their curatorial intensive professional development program. She later received ICI's 2017 Colección Patricia Phelps de Cisneros Travel Award for Central America and the Caribbean. During the fellowship, she conducted research in the Dominican Republic, Panama, the Bahamas, Jamaica, and Trinidad that directly contributed to the Tropicalist Political Exhibition that we have downstairs. We want to thank the ICI team, especially Renaud Proche, Executive Director, and Zoe Dubuler, their Programs Coordinator for the organization of tonight's event. Now I'm going to introduce the panelists, Marina Reyes Franco and Ilaria Conti, and I want to remind you that after the conversation, there is some Q&A time, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them at the end. There is also a reception after, so please, if you want to stay. Um, Marina Reyes Franco is a curator at the Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Puerto Rico, MAC. In 2010, she co-founded La N, an itinerant museum and collection. Recent projects include El Momento del Yagrumo and La Llave La Clave at MAC San Juan. De Loisa a La Loisa, a MAC en el Barrio Public Art Commission by Daniel Lind Ramos. Resisting Paradise at Publica San Juan and Fonderie Darling, Montreal. Watch Your Step, Mind Your Head, IFA Galerie Berlin, the second Grand Tropical Biennial in Loiza, Puerto Rico, Sucursal, Malva in Buenos Aires, and numerous exhibitions at La N. Then Ilaria Conti, curatorial work focuses on research-based artistic practices engaging with decolonial epistemologies and the relationship between institutional infrastructures, communal care, curatorial ethics, labor, and civic agency. Currently, she serves as curator at the American Federation of Arts, advancing frameworks of this is decentralized and sustainable exhibition making, focus on contemporary art and social and cultural justice. Previously, she served as research curator at the Centre Pompidou for Cosmopolis, a multi-year platform devoted to research-based artistic practices and the colonial methodologies. As assistant curator for the 2016 Marrakesh Biennial and as Crest Interpretive Fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, among other positions. So with no further ado, welcome everyone. Welcome Marina Linaria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Thank you for that bio, that was a mouthful. <laughs> so I guess what we will try to do tonight is, you've all seen the show downstairs, right? Um, so we will delve into that, but trying to zoom out, look at some of the macro areas, some of the methodologies, and weave in specific elements, specific content, but just I guess we saw this as an opportunity for Marina to move around and share all the articulations that this project has taken on across the years since the travel grant onwards somehow, right? Uh, uh, yes, I mean, even before the travel grant, I think that it, uh, I can link this, um, you know, the, this exhibition project, but also the may, maybe two previous other shows as well to, or three, <laughs> to my return to Puerto Rico and just like trying to find my place there and seeing how much it had been transformed and questioning, you know, who who is it being transformed for? Who are the, uh, you know, 
the different laws <laughs> uh, being made for, uh, what's the, how the landscape is being transformed, how people are were being displaced, or you know, just like several issues that really bothered me. And then I had to find a way, like a creative outlet, for me to deal to deal with it and to work through it, and also like bring other people along <laughs> for the ride. <laughs> so I think that it makes us feel like less alone and in the it, within our own community and in the context of. Um, a show that you know that brings in people from different parts of the Caribbean is also a way to reach out and like see who shares our own our same the same problematics. So then, just to get started, one of the strong conceptual roots that um, we find as we look into the into this research project is really this genealogy that you shed light on and that connects somewhat the plantation to the resort um, all the way to the fiscal paradise. And um, I found that to be very interesting and I wanted to start it there because I feel that in a way, like by looking at these three elements, your project addresses ways in which um, kind of coloniality and colonial mechanisms reinvent themselves across time through different strategies and they find ways to stay alive and to continue to thrive somewhat. So I wanted to begin by, f with this by asking you somewhat whether you could unpack for us the relationship between these three elements, again, plantation, resort, fiscal paradise, and how this genealogy has somewhat informed or structured um, your curatorial research. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, um, I think that a lot of the connections that I try to make, you know, in conceptually in the show and like through and through the chosen works, but also connecting lived experience, uh, stems from just the exp the the history of Puerto Rico. But then from the history of Puerto Rico, I'm trying to connect it to other places, and. In, in the case of the, what we, we could call like the plantation to resort kind of pipeline in terms of the people who are working there, but also the geographic coincidence. Uh, and sometimes when you visit um, uh, maybe Jamaica, in, in Puerto Rico I don't think that it's as, um, I mean I don't want to say that it's not as obvious, but I don't think that it is part of the historical narrative or like, or, or how people speak about the, the place. So maybe in a, a place in Puerto Rico, in Rio Grande, you could figure out that these used to be plantation lands, like whether it was sugarcane or um, or or like or or coconut plantations. But now they're occupied by like a Hyatt resort or whatever. In in a place like Jamaica, it is very much part of the narrative that they tell you. And so it's part of the tours. It's part of the. Um, the haunt, the haunted house uh, tour, or or like reenactment, where people are cosplaying as enslaved people. So there is this constant like self exploitation that you are part of if you partake in any of the touristic activities. So um, yeah, like I wanted to highlight that complicity across <laughs> across time and 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 space. But I think that the origin of this is really like how the Americas in general, but also the Caribbean in particular, because it was this first point of encounter and genocide and, and exploitation, uh, that uh, these ideas of um, this, these fantasies, these projections about the other really like started there and continue to be like this. They reinvent themselves. Maybe it's not the, um, Maybe it's not through the imagining of like headless headless creatures uh, in in the tropics, but maybe it's through like advertisement or like uh, or advertisements for like sex work in the Caribbean. So there it, there is this exploitation across time uh, that goes from the land, from the territory to the body, and like to how we present ourselves as well. And in the case of finance, I think that. You know, in post-plantation economies, you know, we go from agriculture to um, to in the to industrialization in some places, and then in the 1990s, there is this real push towards uh, economic development and tourism. It started in the 60s, but really, like, it cements itself in the in the 1990s. 
And in parallel to that, there is the establishment of the tax havens and the fiscal paradises. So there is this juxtaposition of imagery, like imagery of paradise and the, and, and then, you know, whatever else works for, uh, uh, yeah, for, for the West, basically. So like, how can, we, how can we continue to exploit these lands beyond what the land can give us, beyond what the bodies can give us? And it's through the creation of these, like, you know, shell companies. And another thing that I think, looking at the macro aspect of the project is, that you somewhat cultivate a diagonal approach um, does not, that does not necessarily represent a region or the region per se, right? Um, you use a much broader terminology, which is um, artists working in the Caribbean sphere, which can mean many different things. And so what I found very interesting is that it is rather about sort of the methodologies and the research that the artists involved bring to the table. Uh, what, what is maybe, what is their relationship to the Caribbean in terms of having lived there uh, or, or being part of the Caribbean diaspora elsewhere as well? Yes. Yeah. So like the artist, the, the biography of the artist in the exhibition is also sometimes just like not so clear cut uh, and it can go, <laughs> it can have its own twists and turns, like Carolina Caicedo's uh, biography or, or Dave Smith's, maybe, you know. Yes, and, um, but then in this regard, what I wanted to ask you about is somewhat, um, because this research has evolved, and again, you've encompassed various artists and various practices, I wanted to ask you, on the one hand, whether you can tell us a little bit about the process through which you created um, connections, with artists during the research. So um, we were talking while preparing for, the, for this event about the fact that you in included artists whose locales you visited. So there was a specific methodology yeah. of study, research, and involvement. And so the connections that you forged through this with the artists, but also how the project or your research might have in turn informed or transformed to a certain degree the work of the artists themselves, or res how they responded to your curatorial input somewhat. I think that's the proudest thing they, you know, that I can say that I, that I have in in some way in like influenced not not only through you know having commissioned pieces in a show, but more so like the conversations and maybe like the future work of an artist. Like that is amazing, um, but speaking to like how kind of the ethics of choosing who can be part of a show or not um, uh, or who I wanted to invite to the show and the and, like my own ethics of like how I wanted the, the because if it's going to be framed as a as a show of Caribbean artists or Caribbean art like I have to you have to be very aware of the previous history of how the Caribbean has been shown uh, or curated um, or uh, in interpreted. Uh, who is your audience as well? I think that that is important. In my case, I was very aware of how problematic it can be <laughs> to try to encompass like the production of a whole area. I, I, I myself have maybe been to shows have been like uh, I don't know like you can't you can't try to uh, please everyone or address every issue, and I don't think that it should be like that. So it's not really about the region, it's about artists producing under a particular set of circumstances, economic, political, um, and in some way, yes, addressing what happens in this geographic area. Uh, so they could be working elsewhere, but they are referring to you know, uh, what's going on in this place. Um, I went to, as Carla mentioned, the Bahamas, Jamaica, uh, Panama, the Dominican Republic, and Trinidad. And I had very specific reasons for deciding where, where to go. I was interested, I remain interested in uh, the, resignifi the resignification of spaces and landscape and how places are transformed by military presence. Uh, and then what happens once those lands revert to civilian use and how Probably most of the time, uh, they never revert to uh, to the people who were dispossessed by that military presence. 
right? Uh, and I think that that is an experience that I can relate to in terms of you know, the history of Puerto Rico, but then that connects to uh, American presence all over the Caribbean and the deal that the British did with the Americans. Once Britain was under attack during World War II, uh, the United States uh, had this agreement that they would lease lease uh, military bases, naval bases for 99 years. So often, as, and this happened in Trinidad, when they gained independence in the 1960s, they still had to negotiate with the Americans so that they would leave. Um, so like, I, I wanted to see these connections. Uh, there was that, um, obviously the coincidence of the tax shelter and the, and, and the, and the islands, but also how um, the ex kind of the exploited body, the, 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 ex the exploitation of racialized bodies, of female bodies, and, uh, and that inerrant relationship to, the, to the, the territory and landscape, the kind of feminization of the, of the landscape. And those were the themes, and like those were some of the artists that I was drawn to. I met a lot of other artists whose work I'm still interested in, but for this show, I I had to pick maybe like a temporality, of kind of when the work was produced, uh, roughly. <laughs> uh, I guess that there's maybe works that are the old. The oldest one is from 1989, but I included it to be in dialogue with uh, a, a more a much more recent video by. Um, by Nivia, Nivia Pastrana. Uh, but the oldest work might be from, otherwise the oldest work is from maybe 2012. So there is like a, a period of time uh, that, I, that I wanted to address. And that relates also, I'm kind of thinking about it now, it relates to my own lived experience. Like coming, returning home and realizing how things are <laughs> in a way. Uh, yeah, so that, that's pretty much it. I think about it a lot in terms of, like, I cannot speak, uh, uh, speak to a reality that I haven't experienced right now. Like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to include people just to check a box, like, oh, I included people from, like, the Dutch-speaking Caribbean, and no. So most of the, like, all of the artists I either, I either met um, when I visited, or um, I got to know their work because they're not no longer living in, you know, in in the Bahamas, for example, or whatever, or the Dominican Republic. But I got to know their work as I traveled. And the only artist that I didn't go there uh, was uh, Gladys Gamby. She's from Martinique, and we met uh, during a residency in Aruba. So that was pretty much it. Like how I wanted to <laughs> edit, really. And sort of thinking about these connections with the artists, the other sort of follow up to the question that I wanted to share just sort of as a resonance or for you to comment on is also your curatorial research as a strategy to create connections among the artists. And as you were saying, this is something that might be long term, but I wanted to again read this little excerpt from your text from a text you wrote in 2019 for the exhibition Resisting Paradise mm -hmm. with Apex Art because I think that there are some infrastructural aspects that are very interesting and that not, not everybody might keep mm. present in their mind, right? And so you wrote, um, though geographically close, Caribbean artists are often unable to travel and show within the region. Intra-regional exchange is challenged by variations in language and colonial history, while flight routes prioritize the convenience of visitors coming from the United States or Europe, mirroring the migration patterns of many post-colonial subjects. So I just want to ask you if you could speak for a moment about how this kind of research, again, also draws connections in diagonal ways that might not be there otherwise because of this lack of yeah, movement. Be because otherwise the diagonal goes through Miami. Uh -huh. Basically, <laughs> it's like everything goes through Miami, uh, and I think that that kind of also speaks about like Puerto Rico's own. Uh, I don't want to say like fall from grace, <laughs> but like we used to have a hub. 
And there, there used to be, it, it was a flight hub. Um, there were more flights, there was more connection, there was, uh, there was actually uh, Prenair. There was an airline that was based in San Juan that, are, that, that was owned by Puerto Ricans and that connected the Caribbean. And I think that a lot of uh, people from the like Anglo-Caribbean, they make fun of their own airlines because they're like really bad, like notoriously late, you cannot rely on them. So it's like a bus that <laughs> goes through like several islands. And uh, also more recently, I wrote a text with Sofia Galliza that spoke of, that, that was about like this impossibility of connecting through, um, through the ocean, like through the sea, because like, well, not, not impossibility, but like, um, whereas in like the original occupiers of these lands, like the original, um, you know, settlers, they, they also considered the sea like part of their territory. But now for us, the sea is like that barrier, you know, like, or you can either traverse it if you're really, really uh, like a marginal subject uh, or a very rich person. So like there's, there's like those two extremes are the ones that really navigate. Uh, otherwise, you have to go through Miami, basically. Um, and in, in the case of the connections of the artists, I, I wanted, it, I wanted them to be aware of each other's practice and eventually meet. <laughs> uh, I think that's my, you know, that's the, maybe, and I think that it might be happening in Miami, actually. <laughs> I think that it happened very recently in Miami as well. And I was actually very happy to know that, um, like, the, the artwork by Jose, by Jose Morbang, uh, he just presented New, new paintings that are based on like these fantastic but very real proposals that were, um, that were done in the Dominican Republic to develop like architectural proposals to develop tourism in Santo Domingo and they're like crazy, crazy ideas. So he's now making like these fantastical paintings about what the government proposed, what could have been, but thankfully didn't happen. <laughs> Thank you and so Again, going back somewhat to the methodology through which the entire project and research has been evolving, um, one of the other things that um, I think is really very interesting is that it's been a multi-stage curatorial methodology that is somewhat, it's cumulative, right? From one project to the next or one text or in one talk and so on and so forth. So it's been constructed through multiple elements, but also different types, different genres of curatorial work. So I wanted to ask you whether maybe not everybody is aware of these various steps, or if you want to touch upon a few of those that have led to the show that we see downstairs. Yes. Um, I think that, yeah, I think that one of, the, one of the things that we were discussing is how not everything has to become an exhibition. And I think that there is there is a time and a place and like and some economics that make it make that possible but you can also advance your ideas through you know writing talks uh, uh, exploring during a residency uh, kind of like widening your world in a certain way but in in my case definitely the kind of journals that I that I did during my um, during the uh, the travel grant period, those were foundational because they recorded like very specific anecdotes, anecdotes and things that were happening without like um, having to retrospectively like over intellectualize an experience or an exchange. So I love that because that is like a crystallization of what happened and what moment, like those little jokes, the, the random people that I, that I met, um, the, I don't know, like the bomb shelter <laughs> in Trinidad somewhere in the jungle. Uh, that, was, that was cool. But I, even before that, I organized this exhibition called uh, What's Your Step, Mind Your Head, and uh, that was at um, IFA Gallery in Berlin. I have no clear idea of how it was received by an audience in Berlin, but I know that at least I wanted to, um, oh, and, that was with Sofia Galliza Muriente and uh, an artist from Ibiza um, called Irene de Andres Vega. And the three of us had been contributing videos, uh, scan documents, links, e everything to this common archive that both of them used to make individual works. 
and then I was just like part of it. <laughs> I was contributing to it. Um, so what they researched, like I got to see and reference in my texts, etc. And they were working on it by themselves. Like, well, obviously I was involved, but they were they were either either way they were going to do something with it. And then the opportunity came up to propose a show in in Berlin under this program that's called Untied to Tie. And they were um, like over multiple years. Uh, curator Alia Septi, she was she is. Uh, kind of unraveling the consequences of German colonialism in different spheres. And that was the first year, and um, that was in 2017. So I had been there the, um, the year before, and I had be become aware of how different German institutions, especially at the federal level, were really keen on dissecting their own complicity in, uh, in like 19th century colonialism and like the crimes of like imperial past. Thinking that, well, maybe we have, um, and everybody knows that like, we've come to terms and like addressed the issues of the 20th century, but now we want to go way back. Uh, so IFA had been doing that, um, the, the German Historical Museum as well, but then on the city side, the city of Berlin and a particular foundation, I forget the name now, but it's related to Humboldt Forum, that brings together all the different uh, colonial collections and like ethnographic collections to one huge building in the middle of the city. Like they were very, very keen on exploiting that, ex that imperial past and kind of referencing this, uh, like a past that they could be proud of as Germans. So, I, like I don't know how they received <laughs> our look to um, like the decrepit, you know, present of uh, Spain, sp like Spanish in, uh, imperialism in Puerto Rico, like as it was uh, addressed by Irene's pieces, or like Sofia's critique of uh, of tourism. Actually, one of the pieces B roll is in Marcela's show at the Whitney, but it was definitely in that context. <laughs> so I, I hope someone got something. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then um, Resisting Paradise was a second show that, that was done after the travel grant. So I was able to work with artists that I had met um, while I was in Jamaica and Joydi Minaya, who lives here in New York, uh, but I got to see her work in the Bahamas. So it was a way of bringing people again together. I was also questioned, like, why didn't you include a Puerto Rican artist mm -hmm. in the show? Because the first time that I presented it was in Puerto Rico, and then it traveled to to Montreal. And in both cases, I was questioned about like who was left out <laughs> from this Caribbean art show. Um, in Puerto Rico, it was like, why why didn't you include a Puerto Rican? And I'm like, well because we already, like, we always see shows by Puerto Ricans. The weird, the, the, you know, the weird thing is that we're seeing art from, artists from, you know, from next door, basically. And, and in Montreal, um, it, was, it was an interesting conversation regarding, uh, like, Caribbean, Caribbean communities living there that didn't feel included within the like institutional um, framework, like the art institutions in the city. So it's like, oh, great, like you're welcoming this Caribbean people, but not the ones that, who live here. And you know, what can I say to that? I'm like, well, it's your problem. <laughs> Learn to deal with it, I don't know. Well, I guess there's another important and complementary aspect to this multi-step approach that we've, we're discussing, and I think it's another important thing to flag, um, because sometimes there's not a lot of re reflection around how curatorial projects came, come to life, right? Uh, seem to be coming out of the blue. But one of the things that you commented on while we were chatting in advance of, the, of this event is that sort of this multi-step approach also had to do with the economics of the research, Completely. right? <laughs> so what was economically possible? And one thing that I think you mentioned, which I think it's very interesting, is sort of how to deal with all the forces that are outside the realm of artistic production per se, as a curator, but also dealing with 
artists and artists' work, and they having to deal with forces that are outside the purview of artistic work, but that shape inherently what is possible. So I wanted to ask you if you could address a little bit also that, because I think it's sort of integral to how the project has developed over time. I work in an institution now, so I, so I can sort of imagine uh, having a home for ideas, you know? Uh, but before I started this, I most definitely did not work at an institution. Uh, so I was working independently. I had been kind of roaming from, I, I mean, I managed an artist studio for a while. I wor worked for a lot in Calzadilla for a while. Uh, that was what actually made possible me staying in Puerto Rico and not returning to Buenos Aires. I lived there for a while, like almost seven years. Um, and so, that's what enabled me to stay home, like to stay home. And once I was there, it was like I once I ended up really wanting to, like, not be a studio manager <laughs> and dedicate myself more fully, like, fully to to this research. I was wandering, like, different residencies, getting gigs, writing, and that really advanced certain ideas. Like for example, like next year I'm gonna work on a show that's based on an article that I wrote several years ago. So it it never like it never stops helping, but at the same time it was like a real struggle. Uh, so in the end what you end up like what I ended up thinking about was how can I advance my ideas without um, like thinking that I can't achieve something until it's like a full blown, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> uh, so I basically kept it like on a very like practical level, I kept it to like a 10,000 euro or $10,000 like, cap, uh, making sure that the amount of artists that I, that I was inviting um, was was reasonable in the sense of like that I could pay for their for their trips or the organization could pay for their trips uh, that um, that everybody got paid <laughs> that I that we had enough money to either ship works or have people travel with them or reproduce them uh, so that was on a very pla practical level because the second one I actually like completely produced on my own uh, so that's kind of the nature of the Apex card. Uh, Apex Art Grant, you have to manage everything. Uh, and I was really grateful for that. I think that it really makes you understand uh, kind of the nitty gritty of things. And, I, and it also made me remember uh, a presentation that I saw by Julieta Gonzalez, who's like a very, uh, like a curator that I admire a lot. And it's actually one of the first curators that I admired and got to know in person when she lived in Puerto Rico around 20, I don't know, uh, 2004 or something like that. Uh, Julieta told us in, a, in an ICI uh, <laughs> presentation actually, uh, she told us how she did a show with $10,000 and with like $50,000. And I think that that is a very like a kind of accordion-like <laughs> uh, way of producing and thinking that is, that is very relevant that I think that makes it possible for you to bring projects in spaces that might not be as um, as you know as resource heavy as a city like New York might be, and that doesn't put a stop to your projects uh, just because there's no money right now. But also, don't exploit yourself and don't exploit artists. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> you touched upon this. <laughs> earlier, but I want to go back and drill further down. Um, I think another thing that is very interesting is sort of this ongoing and contextual relevance of your research to the place where you live and work now, right? So San Juan and Puerto Rico in general. And um, I, I, was, I was mentioning to you that when thinking about sort of this strong relationship that you have with a place, with forms of activism in that place, with the communities of that place. Um, the expression that came to mind was curating in the first person. And 
another thing that I mentioned that I just, to give some context, was I was thinking about this beautiful article written a few years ago by Maria Lugones, who talks about being a callejera, like walking and thinking and doing research from the street, at the street level, rather than what she calls at the strategies level, which is perched up high. It's sort of the theory versus what is there on the ground. So um, I wanted to ask you whether you could talk a little bit about that, because I think that, of course, it's not, uh, it's complex, and it goes, again, with what is happening in your, um, in the place where you live and work, and here too, I wanted to bring about something that you wrote in 2018. Uh, you, you were asking, I guess, yourself, um, is a crisis still a crisis when it's the permanent state of living, right? And so, in a way, you are in this permanent state of living. So, curating from that specific positionality, what does that entail? like where where to begin um i always tell this anecdote of how um up and returning to san juan and during the first couple of months actually for like the first maybe three months i was there temporarily <laughs> until i did not want to return to argentina anymore so i and I, I stayed and i started seeing how things were changing in particular there was this um this area that connects Old San Juan to another very touristy area, um, uh, Condado, and you have to go through uh, part of the San Juan Islet that's called uh, Puerta de Tierra, which means like literally like dirt door. Uh, so it was always an area, it, it continues to be an area uh, that is still very much uh, marginal, very racialized, uh, it's full of, I, I think it right now it has like maybe four active um, public housing projects, mm -hmm. and that's because some others have already been, uh, implo actually one was imploded, <laughs> uh, and now they are becoming like mixed, ha mixed, um, mixed income housing, so they, they, they are progressively pushing people out. Anyway, uh, there was this development that was, well, it was successfully Com completed uh, Paseo Puerta de Tierra. And Paseo Puerta de Tierra it started off as a proposal to the federal government for, uh, for a bike lane. And the bike lane ended up being a $50 million project that included two sculptures, no, like a, a sculpture that we successfully like, campaigned to cancel. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank God. Um, and uh, a mural, a restaurant, uh, just, I mean, basically like just ar architectonic, like it was, it's horrible, it's really horrible. And they raised the, the line of the horizon. Basically like before you could drive through, to Old San Juan, like you could see the horizon, you could see the sea, and now you really can't, like except in some places, uh, you need to maybe like find parking somewhere and like, and then, go out and, and, and do what the, um, what the landscape architecture is like compelling you to do. <laughs> so anyway, that was um, the activism that started around that particular project and the reaction and rejection by the, both communities from Old San Juan and from Puerta de Tierra uh, was very significant and very influential. Actually, the first kind of like pop-up show, kind of garden, like sculpture garden show that I organized was in 2015. And it was basically like an activist uh, uh, 4th of July <laughs> kind of celebration or something. Uh, well, not celebration, but kind of, you know. And uh, that really brought together two communities, one that is more, um, that has more, uh, has more power, has more money, and then the people in, 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 in Puerta de Tierra. And many projects started coming out of this uh, because of artists who lived around there, um, and people were becoming more aware of what was going on, even the, the community, because they had only realized that uh, the uh, bus routes had changed. They didn't know what else was coming or that everything was connected, that there were five phases and that they were in phase three of construction, et cetera. So that was, I think, my reintroduction 
to being in Puerto Rico and my first spark uh, of interest, and it stems from being pissed off. <laughs> and, and then connecting to other people who were also feeling uh, the same way. And then that ended up uh, being a, a way of continuing, like having continuing conversations with Sofia Galliza, for sure. We were roommates at the time, uh, with uh, Gillo Tirado, too. So I think that they have continued to be very, very present. As for the crisis part, <laughs> I think that um, every, uh, I mean, there are times when there is this particular focus put on like the cultural production or artistic production of a place, a country, a city, and it's very much related to what crisis they're going through. Uh, what is making the art of X place interesting, right? Uh, we could talk about how Detroit uh, went through that, you know, in a way, Argentina in 2001. Uh, and then in and in Puerto Rico as well, and there is a, a there is a specific attention that is related to our um, well, first the declaration of bankruptcy around 2015, I believe that it was. Uh, then of course Hurricane Maria, etc. And I I I live knowing that the the reason why I, I am employed is because of these crises, because. Uh, actually, what's happened is that, yes, there is a lot of need and there is a lot of scarcity and a lot of scarcity politics that go with fundraising and, and money that can be um, accessed because of crisis. Um, and there is a, and we, are, and we are receiving that attention. So it's like, I do question that. It's like, I don't think that we're ever getting out of this uh, scarcity crisis mode. <laughs> But the weird, the weird thing is, is that it has also brought with it a lot of money for the arts. Uh, so I think that artists, a lot of artists now in Puerto Rico also existing, are existing within that uh, dichotomy as well. It's like, how long is this gonna last? How long is this attention gonna last? Um, how long is this support for our institution gonna last? Uh, are we gonna be able to fend for ourselves <laughs> if, if the net is removed, in a way. No. And as a quick follow-up to that, because you discussed already a little bit the reception of these different projects in different locales, so I'm going to skip that part. Mm -hmm. But something that sort of you're touching upon is the attention these artists or these works receive. And going back to the exhibition you did in Berlin, you wrote something interesting about the artists that were part of that specific project, but I wanted just to sort of ask you about it, because you were talking about um, Sofia and Irene's um, work, and you were saying that they sort of get rid of the colonizing gaze that is imposed of, on them, and that um, sort of in the, they're being presented, but they're also aware of how they're being yeah. looked at. Yeah, they're aware how they're looked at, and I also understand the irony of like, talking about the colonial uh, practices with a Spanish artist, but, but she's from Ibiza. And Ibiza is like a part, this, it's just considered a party island. And, and I think that she, uh, so, so there was this identification with that, with that issue, like how the people react to where I'm from, like how I grew up, like how the economy of the place and the uh, lifestyle um, and uh, just, social life of the um, of the town revolved around what the desires of other people and the excesses of other people <laughs> um, so that is that's also why there was this uh, despairing I forgot the question <laughs> no it was just more kind of a poking you on a specific point just to get exactly. like your thoughts or reaction on that but mm. I think you've answered that okay <laughs> The last thing I want to ask you before we somewhat start opening it up to the Q&A part is um, because this research is so multidisciplinary, because it can go in so many directions, I wanted to ask you about sort of further developments. We know that the show will travel to your 
sort of home institution, but also I wanted to ask you more broadly where you think this might unfold or what are some of the um, elements or lines um, through which you think you may want to continue to work on this? Yes, I mean, most, most definitely uh, right now the exhibition was also thought for this space uh, and how it could travel to Puerto Rico. So the space is roughly the same. And so that was like the, the limitation, that was the limitation. Um, and, and I'm glad that I got limits <laughs> put, on me, put on me as well. Um, but I've always thought that there are, uh, th there are two ways, kind of two ways in which this can go and I want it to go. Uh, and probably some of it I'll be able to explore very soon. Uh, one is like delving deeper into uh, Puerto Rican art history and the history of how artists have reacted to, to tourism or interacted with tourists. Uh, and in the case of Puerto Rico, it's not only tourists, it's also like the um, um, kind of uniformed military presence around town when that used to happen in, in old San Juan in the 1950s in particular uh, and, and 1960s. But I want, I very much want to connect those historical um, moments of like fighting for, for the access to the beaches and protecting the coastline and, the, and natural resources now um, to what artists were doing or, or like really civil society was doing in uh, maybe in the 1970s uh, against like the copper mines or, or the possibility of establishing mines in Puerto Rico uh, and the um, Las Playas Son Nuestras, which is still a slogan uh, that's used right now, the, but stems from the 1960s and that struggle. So I, I think that across uh, Puerto Rican art history and Puerto Rican history, like I, I that's something that I want to like dig deeper. Definitely, most likely will happen like through an essay or something like that. Maybe like an illustrated essay. <laughs> it could become a show, but I'm thinking like first let's start with a text and something that is more rooted in like art historical research, which I also kind of miss. Uh, I kind of miss doing <laughs> and. Uh, and then the other very interesting part is like how, where can we expand this to because definitely like the mechanisms of colonialism, neocolonialism and like how how it is how it transforms itself how it is like roaming uh, around different parts of the world that is most definitely not an exclusively Caribbean uh, experience uh, these the, the colonizing gaze has been you know placed upon many, many, many parts of the, of the world. And I think that it would be really nice to kind of expand this throughout like uh, maybe considering other tropics, other tropical experiences, or just um, as I was, uh, I mentioned recently to, to Renaud, I had, I originally had this, um, had this spark when I met a couple of artists from, from Switzerland and they were like saying how much they related to what I was talking to them about in terms of the picturesque and this uh, creation of, of fantasy and kind of a, a backdrop for people's fantasies, like a, a place, and like an actual place just being, uh, just being maintained and, and, and like manicured in a certain way to cater to people's expectations. And, it, and like that didn't correspond to why something first became a tradition or why like a, a place used to look a certain way. Now it's just being kept there because it's what, uh, what you expected to see. Like they want, they, wanna, they wanna cater to you. And the people who live there need to get on, you know, get with the program. <laughs> I'm from Rome, so I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, um, I guess this is our opportunity to open yes. up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I've also had like great conversations with uh, curators and artists from Greece. Yeah. I think that that was always something that um, like an unexplored uh, area. And hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll be able to, to make something work. But uh, the debt crisis, the joke that um, 
that a German like finance minister made some years ago that like if the U.S. is criticizing Germany for how we treat Greece, then we'll exchange Greece for Puerto Rico. Like that was a joke that he made. Uh, so I, I think that there's lots of things to to explore, whether deeper or like across uh, different parts of the world. It, it, it'd be cool. <laughs> So do you want to open up with a question to the public? Like, we want your questions, but we thought that maybe as an icebreaker we could pose a question to, <laughs> to all of you. <laughs> Should I go? Just as a follow-up to what she's just been talking about, like other adjacent, parallel, similar experiences of this touristization, tropicalization, tropization, I don't know, I'm making up words in English, but, um, just responses or questions for Marina, of course, but just yeah. to open it up to also some counter thoughts around what we've been just discussing, <laughs> no? Yeah, I mean, in, in relation to the, other, uh, to the other venues where those other exhibitions have been shown, like they are more, I mean, Berlin is a very multicultural city, but still, you know, um, I, I probably New York is New York is way more uh, definitely much more than than Montreal so I think that the experiences that people from like that currently live in New York um, can connect to the works there like it would be nice to know what are your reactions like what what you feel that like speaks to you and your experience or like where you come from or whatever if anyone wants to say something that was my question to you <laughs> But you can also ask me anything. <laughs> I'll, I'll offer one. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you very much for this. Thank you for this great show. Uh, when I, this is not me directly, but when I came to visit, I think I might have told you this when, when I saw you a few weeks ago. When I came to visit the show um, a couple months ago, I came with a friend who was a curator in Cape Town, uh, South Africa, Storm Jansa van Rensburg, who's at uh, Zeitzmoka, where he's the deputy to Koyo Kuo, um, and he's he's you know from South Africa. We have, and we he, have a pending meeting soon. Well, there you go. And and he okay. came in and he was like, "Yep, Cape Town, um, a, a place with a maintained uh, you know colonial post-apartheid whatever it is fantasy, the place." you know, the entrance to Africa for, you know, the white people who then go to like hunt or do go, go on safari. But also, uh, in addition to that, some very, very deep political economy issues in the city, which, you know, I've seen also by, by spending time there. In particular, uh, huge amounts of the city that have just gone over to Airbnb flippers, right? Just like massive. Um, and, and, other, and other factors like that. So then without, you know, without mapping too many one-to-one -one correspondences, um, there, are, there are connections there, and I, I would venture that the ones that he evinced in, in Cape Town would be ones that others could, could see in various ways in various other places that are not just about like, you know, the experience, um, the fantasy, the catering, the, the for whom, the, you know, the, the, the um, uh, and and the implications for both the material and the felt lives of people who are there, who themselves are layered and layered and layered, right? With many themselves in very, very different positions. But also, um, it's read, and this, this I think is the great, great strength of your show, is that it has such a strong political economy premise. It's not just tropical, it's political. It's really, it's, this, is, this is a political economy show. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, this is a show, you could maybe just make a few adjustments to the wall text and so on, and you could bring, you could bring master's degree students in, in international relations or economics or development economics to this show. This is, this is one of those shows that makes those transdisciplinary connections. Um, and I think that's a great strength of it. And, and, and it, it, it asks us to think not just about Global South, colonialism, decoloniality, all those different things, but it asks us to think about the world economy, um, uh, but systemically, structurally, and all the way down to the micro level of like La Puerta de Tierra or, 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 or whatever it might be. So I, I just wanted to put that on the table. Thank, thank you, Siddhartha. Thank you. Always so, so flattering. Um, but uh, I mean, yes, mo most definitely. I think that the, the Caribbean is such a, uh, 
as as a region, but I mean this and this can also be said about um, about like colonialism in Africa. It's like it's so key to how like um, mercant mercantilism, uh, uh, capitalism, and now like neoliberal strategies. Like it's fundamental. Like how they go through like those kind of. Uh, what are the like the bank cables, like the internet cables that go like underneath the, the ocean? <laughs> like those are the those are the connections. You know, it goes through here, or it goes through I don't know other islands like Isle of Man or the, all those places that are um, kind of afterthoughts in some people's minds, but uh, they are key to how the world is run, how the how the money is laundered, <laughs> and who uh, it, that's fascinating to me. And uh, yeah, and who who gets who gets the power to tell stories. The, the microphone was already handed to me, so um, uh, thank you for the wonderful conversation. I'm a curator based in Germany, and uh, thanks to knowing Ilaria, I got to be here in, in this uh, beautiful show and in, in the context of your talk. Um, so I'm not based in Berlin, but in Munich, and I'm, unfortunately I haven't seen your show in Berlin, but I could very much relate to what you were saying about the Humboldt Forum and their attempt to overcorrect history, but then failing doing that because they kind of like go um, too far. They, they, we have an expression in German like shooting beyond the goal. That's something that they sometimes do. Um, but your question to us of um, other regions that have changed that, um, that have become tropicalized, um, I have an, um, an association that relates to something else that you were sharing earlier about how um, the ocean has become the the image of the ocean has become the barrier that doesn't connect the islands because that's what happened from a German perspective onto the Mediterranean that when I was growing up in the 90s had been this region of um, uh, leisure and, and where you would go for holidays and totally not politicized and now the Mediterranean has become this barrier between Africa and Europe that um, so that islands like Lampedusa that have been known as these tropical, um, yeah, uh, or not tropical, of course, because they're not tropical, but Mediterranean um, holiday spots have now an, an entirely different uh, connotation. So that doesn't, th that kind of changes what you were asking for, but still is an association that goes into that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hola, Marina. Hey. Hello. So, uh, <laughs> um, so I'm Aime. For those that don't know me, um, I work here. <laughs> I wanted to ask two. Um, uh, well, I wanted to ask one question and one comment, and they both have a personal tone. So, um, the question is uh, with regards to your research and with regards to. You know, there's something about this show, and there's this very specific type of visitor that Puerto Rico is getting, you know, and, and by visitor, I don't only mean like people going there, but also the attention that Puerto Rico and the Caribbean is getting lately, uh, which is the, the crisis visitor, the post-crisis visitor that you're receiving after Hurricane Maria, which is a topic that Marcela has directly addressed in her show. And that is a topic that I relate to very personally because I came to be as an Argentinian post-2001 crisis. I became an adult in the early 2000s in Argentina. And I feel that's a very specific um, professional and personal growth that we had to go through. And I wanted to ask you if you feel any ambivalence about that attention that, that Puerto Rico and the region is getting right now after Maria. Um, and before I hear your answer, I also wanted to make a personal comment, which is that I'm so, so, so happy you did this show. And thank, thank you, Marina, no, and thank, I adore thank, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I'm gonna address the last part. Thank you, I met for the invitation. And also, I think that uh, the dedication of you, your team, and everybody, like, it made it possible for me to, like, I mean, I couldn't like clone myself to like fully dedicate myself to this, but it it made it possible to have a show that will now travel, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, like you all enabled me to carve out that uh, that time and that like headspace, and getting that headspace. Um, 
Uh, ambivalence. N uh, no, not really, because I like I I think that we deserve the attention. It's like it's up to everybody else, like how that attention developed and grew in them. Like that's that's up to everybody else. Um, I just think that we have to be aware of the intentions, be aware of how, like, uh, on, like be aware of the, maybe the personal journey <laughs> that the person that you're engaging with went through to have that attention put on you, to give you that time, or to give you that money or whatever, or to make that invitation. Um, so, no, I feel no ambivalence, but it's, al it's always about, uh, like, you just need to have like certain ethics of how you want to engage. Uh, and I think that like in the post, um, I mean, this is, this is maybe something that like Ricardo Cabret's work speaks about, the remote worker or the person who moved to Puerto Rico. Uh, it could be after the hurricane, but actually there's a set of laws that have existed since 2012 that enable um, in, like high income individuals to come to Puerto Rico to stay, to have like, uh, to pay zero taxes on capital gains or to maybe like pay up to just 4% uh, tax. Uh, they love to live among themselves. They resent having to learn Spanish. They resent uh, that people don't speak English everywhere they go. So they stay within their kind of uh, imagined and created communities, whether they're gated or certain bars or places that they go to. So that is my ambivalence. My ambivalence is towards those people in particular, like what they, their intentions are, and um, uh, yeah. It's, it's more towards people like that, uh, not necessarily kind of the art world at large. I think that you have to take the opportunities that come and try to negotiate and establish um, the terms of that engagement, but we deserve it. <laughs> I think we have time maybe for one last question. Thank you. Hey, um, okay, I'm gonna condense it. Um, so, okay, I love the idea that you did br bring up like curating in the first person. Um, so from what you talked about, from the personal and the political and how you engage curating, um, I wanted to see if you could like dive in a little bit more and how does that develop with the artist? Like, of course you're engaging with so many different artists and they have their own personal and political and historical relation to the place when they're developing this, um, this piece that we're seeing here. So how does that dialogue goes on with you? Like, do you go down like a rabbit hole with them? Or does it develop in, an, in another way where you are looking at that, that they're presenting you, and you're relating it back to PR or you, the experiences that you have personally? It, it depends on the work and the artist. There are some works that I um, knew pretty well. Uh, and I felt like like I had already had the conversations and questions that I that, you know that I was going to pose. Uh, so it was just a matter of like, hey, remember this? Like I have this idea, and uh, kind of give them the uh, just communicate the pitch basically, and have them agree and like see what see what happens. Uh, that that is something that I did with Jennifer and Guillermo with Alora and Calzadilla. It's like, hey, this there's this, but I go directly to them, not through the galleries. Like then they'll tell me like, hey, so this work is owned by X or whatever, and then I'll deal with them. Uh, so there's that approach, which is just more it, slightly more transactional. Uh, but then there's there's works that. Um, that were created for the show as well. So there's people that I have been, and, and some others I've been engaging with in like, and, and been in conversation with uh, for many years, contributed texts to other of their exhibitions, like Gillo Tirado, like that, that neon, like Caribe Hostil, is not created for this show. It, ex it already existed, but I wrote the text for that other exhibition that he did. Um, so 
yeah like i already had some pieces that are that i consider kind of foundational like that they were already there uh i needed i wanted them to be there um that's the case of uh well with gijo it was a matter of like choosing which one <laughs> uh but uh but also Marcela's show helped because I knew what he was going to show. So I'm like, okay, there's this other one. <laughs> uh, just like taking advantage of like, okay, the, these artists are going to have this exposure in the city at the same time. So like, let's show let's, what, they, what they do. Uh, that was the case also with Sofia. Have, like Sofia's having a B-roll at the Whitney made me realize, okay, like I want another, another work by hers. Uh, I don't want it to be just the prints that she had already done and shown in the, at the show in Berlin, so let's commission another video. Uh, and so, so that is way better, and that's uh, that for her, of course, but it also enables me to be in conversation with her for a longer period of time uh, and, uh, and address other issues that were not present in the already like, existing work. Um, who else? With Dalton, uh, with Dalton's uh, painting, I knew that, like I, I knew that I wanted his piece to somehow be uh, closer to the end of the show, like further, you know, down the line in, in terms of the galleries and the placement of the work. And I saw, I saw an opportunity for his. Um, for his work, which is fig figurative, fantastic, uh, very flamboyant, uh, I saw it, I saw in that an opportunity to um, imagine, like, imagine Caribbean selves. Like how like how would you want to be perceived? Uh, give me that like that that's my prompt, and so you you tell me, <laughs> um, and and I think that that was kind of. Um, I know that it was a struggle <laughs> to get to the chango, to get to the Birdman. Uh, I know that it was a struggle, but um, that was the conversation. But there were other pieces that were very much like already part of the checklist. Like uh, Joyris Labadi, I wanted that. Uh, Dion's, uh, Dion Benjamin Smith's piece, I saw at a National Art Gallery of the Bahamas exhibition. That's the quadriptic that says, like, what you see is what you get, uh, real Bohemian art, et cetera. Like, I really wanted that, uh, that piece. Uh, yeah, but then there were other people that, uh, that I met along the way, like Ricardo. Uh, yeah, and I was able, and we were also able to support Onika, um, Onika Russell's piece, the, Velvet souvenirs. What else? I don't remember. I think those are the commissioned ones. Sophia, Onika's, Dalton's, I believe. Yeah. But I don't know if that answers your question. But um, yeah, uh, Jon Jonathan, uh, Donna Conlon, and Jonathan Harker, they were also part of that. Like they had the, the people that were part of the, of, the, of the research, of the visits, like we had already been in touch on and off since 2016, 2017. So it was easy to go back to, it's like, we're not, I mean, even if we're not like buddy buddies, you know, like we know of each other's work and they know what the intentions are and they know the context. So I didn't have to do a lot of explaining regarding uh, the, the context and the ideas that I wanted to, uh, to present. Yeah, so it was easy, easy convincing in general, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you for this. I guess we need to wrap up. Cara says yes. Thank you, Marina. Congrats. Thank you all for being here.